to purchase it at the Labyrinth, which is a local Princeton bookstore. And there's a discount code uh, when you're checking out, if you use the discount code of Sorab's last name, Amari, you'll receive another 10% off. And third, we will have time for questions and answers at the end of Sorab's talk. That will be moderated by me. We have several hundred people on the webinar and it's just best if you submit questions to us and then I'll moderate them to, uh, to Sorab. You can submit questions at any time throughout the talk or, uh, or during the question and answer period by using the Q&A tab that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and you can do that whenever you'd like and the questions will come directly to me. Again, my thanks to all of you for attending and many thanks to you, Saurabh, for joining us. Uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, it seems like it's getting great press and lots of attention. And welcome to Public Discourse. We're, we're glad you could find some time for us. Well, thank you very much, uh, RJ and Witherspoon Institute for, for hosting me today. Um, I am. Um, uh, I should note that the weird wallpaper behind me is not my home. Um, I'm in a hotel because I'm in Washington DC doing various launch events and away from home. And so hence, I apologize about that. That's never something I would have in my own home. Um, RJ very kindly outlined my motivation for writing this book. So I won't dwell on it so much um, other than to say it's a book, as RJ said, born of my anxieties about what kind of a man our civilization will chisel out of my son, Maximilian. He's named after Maximilian Kolbe, the great Franciscan friar and saint who laid down his life at Auschwitz uh, for a complete stranger, as most of you know. And I'm very concerned um, that our contemporary account of what it means to be free and what it means to be fully human, um, if left to form my own son, or rather deform my own son on its own, would make the sacrifice of his namesake insensible to him, because it suggests that freedom is just having maximal individual choice, um, and autonomy, um, and uh, that deeper account of freedom on which uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe's great act at Auschwitz rests um, will be inaccessible to him. So the book and the thread in the title are an attempt to lasso my son, to threat, to tether him to something more than I personally can offer him. Um, and that is broadly encapsulated by the word tradition, hence the thread in the title. Um, I am, um, because I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a theologian, I'm a journalist and storyteller, I decided to couch each of the, um, uh, the book's arguments in the life and kind of drama of one particular thinker. Um, each question in the book's 12 questions is matched to one thinker. And um, the, the question that I was hoping to address with you today is, um, the question is, what is freedom for? And we explore that through Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I won't. Re I would like to read you some of the chapter. So, in like a traditional book reading, which is something we used to do in person. Unfortunately, we can't do that together in person. But I'll give you a taste of the book. I will not be able to go through the entire um, chapter, but I'll. Um, it'll take us part of the way. And um, so, with, without further ado, the question is: What is freedom for? And we begin. Commencement addresses rarely make headlines because most speakers do little more than string together cliches and bromides. But when Alexander Solzhenitsyn addressed Harvard's graduating class of 1978, his words traveled far beyond the collegiate precincts of Cambridge, Massachusetts. For months afterward, the Harvard speech was all Western opinion makers could talk about and not in a good way. His hosts assumed he would follow a certain script Having documented the horrors behind the Iron Curtain before making his home in the land of the free, he was expected to, to sing his variation on the immigrant's ode to America. Solzhenitsyn recalled, quote, what was mainly expected of me was the gratitude of the exile to the great Atlantic fortress of liberty, end quote. But he wasn't one to follow ideological scripts, else he would have thrived as a court writer under communism, nor was he inclined to flatter anyone. On the day, an audience of some 20,000 students, professors, and others, plus a large contingent of journalists packed Harvard Yard to hear him. Dressed in a drab military style jacket with his penetrating gaze and Rasputin-esque beard, the great man must have cut an intimidating figure among the Ivy elites. A heavy rain poured as Solzhenitsyn began to speak. No one scurried away to avoid, avoid the downpour, though many hadn't brought umbrellas. After a long and preemptive standing ovation from the audience, 
he delivered his address in Russian with a simultaneous English translation broadcast over his piercing voice. Harvard's motto, he began, is veritas, truth, and he had come there to share bitter truths. The rain, it turned out, had been a sign of a brooding message to come. The title of his speech was A World Split Apart, evoking the division in that age between two nuclear super superpowers, the one he had fled and the one he had fled to. Yet he devoted the bulk of his speech to the latter, to diagnosing what had gone wrong in the West. He saw in the West an ever expanding culture of what he called legalism, one that allowed, even encouraged, everyone to pursue his own selfish ends up to the limit of the law. Having lived under a lawless regime, he knew how invaluable the rule of law was. Even so, a society with no other scale but the legal is one also less worthy of man, he said. For, quote, such a society fails to take full advantage of the full range of human possibilities, end quote. He saw a West captive to a tyrannical notion of rights, quote, the defense of individual rights, he warned, has reached such extremes as to make society as a whole defenseless against certain individuals. Terrorism ran rampant because there were lawyers and judges less committed to society as a whole than they were to maximizing the rights of defendant who, if they had their way, would destroy society and all rights. Oppressive regimes like the ones he had thrown that had thrown him into the gulag took advantage too, hiring lawyers, pro lobbyists, and other profiteering henchmen to advance their interests in the West legally. He saw an abusive Western media whose overriding concern wasn't in serving the truth or readers, but their own agendas. The media defended the maximal possible freedom for themselves, yet they were accountable no to no one, he said, when they, quote, misled public opinion by inaccurate information or even contributed to mistakes on a state level. At the same time, major outlets maintained a narrow corridor of acceptable opinion, its boundaries set by intellectual fads and corporate interests. Unrestrained freedom exists for the press, Solzhenitsyn said, but not for the readership, because newspapers mostly transmit in a forceful and empathetic way those opinions which do not openly contradict their own and the general tr trend, end quote. What a surprise for someone coming from the totalitarian East, quote, end quote. Solzhenitsyn saw a West where the clamor of intellectual fashion shut out true intellects, where shallow public opinions swallowed true excellence. Your scholars, he charged, quote, are free in a legal sense, but they are hemmed in by the idols of the prevailing fad. There is no open violence as in the East, however, a selection dictated by fashion and the, uh, the need to accommodate mass standards frequently prevents the most independent minded persons from contributing to public life and gives rise to dangerous herd instincts. If all this was Western, what Westerners meant by uh, bringing freedom to the Soviet Union, Solzhenitsyn said, then the nations trapped behind the Iron Curtain would be wise to decline the offer. And this was the most shocking part of the Harvard address. Quote, should I be asked whether I would propose the West, such as it exists today, as a model for my country today, I would frankly have to answer negatively. No, I could not recommend your society for the transformation of ours. While a few hisses rose up from Harvard Yard as the author spoke, his words for the most part elicited bursts of applause from the audience. But afterward, the media and the commentariat he had lacerated went to work. Soon it would become clear that the whirlwind Solzhenitsyn launched at Harvard had, Harvard had permanently unsettled his own reception in the West, turning him from celebrated dissident into reviled reactionary and kooky mystic. The reviews, as they say, were bad, and I won't go through all of uh, the sort of reactions to them, but needless to say that almost the entire mainstream media at the time, the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, even the Conservative National Review, which was a little bit more circumscribed in its criticisms, for the most part, they framed him as a theocrat, a reactionary, an autocrat, a kook, a mystic, and so on. What could a soul nurtured in Russia's despotic soil teach a people for whom freedom is a constitutional birthright? Very little as far as Solzhenitsyn's critics were concerned. As he confided to his memoir, to the Western liberal, liberal mind, I had presumed to judge the experience of the world from the point of view of my own limited Soviet and prison camp experience. But could a gulag serve as a school of freedom? Solzhenitsyn, of course, had himself spent eight years in the gulag system, a system designed to inflict degradation and dehumanization. He used the experience 
to not only obviously blow the whistle using the uh, groundbreaking works such as the Gulag Archipelago, but also to inform his great novel uh, about life in the Gulag, thinly fictionalized and titled, as you all know, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. And what he noticed is in circumstances in which your autonomy and your ability to make choices are reduced to an almost being non-existence, different character types react differently to such circumstances. Shuhab, the protagonist, works hard, serves his fellow prisoners, uh, honors God in his own simple way, and he ends the day, a day in the gulag, happy. He goes to bed content, as the famous final sentence of the novel uh, reads. By contrast, Fetyukov, a fellow prisoner who tries to take advantage, every advantage, to scrounge every last morsel of food and every last drag off every last cigarette butt, ends his day in a miserable and pitiful state. He's beaten up by his comrades and he goes to bed in tears. So for me, what I suggest is those character contrasts raise the question of what could a survivor of, of the Gulag, namely Solzhenitsyn, teach the West about freedom? What indeed? As a prisoner, Solzhenitsyn had lived through and witnessed firsthand much of what he recounted in one day. And far from misunderstanding freedom, he had gained that profound appreciation for it that can only come with near total deprivation. And contrary to his critics' claims, he emphatically didn't favor tyranny or oppose democracy, having suffered the Soviet Union's, quote, centralization of all forms of life, particularly the life of the mind, which he thought amounted to spiritual murder. But could it be that the liberal West, having reduced freedom to a bare legalism and the absence of natural and traditional barriers, was also unfree, only in a different way? This was Solzhenitsyn's early intuition, and the more he time he spent in the West, observing its ways and attempting to navigate them, the more the thought gathered strength in his mind. The loss of many barriers against the individual will, he concluded, had paradoxically robbed Western life of its true freedom. An excess of rights had paved the way to a new serfdom, creating a society in which the Fetyukov type, remember Fetyukov is a character who um, just lives in just for his own gratification of his basis appetites, the Fetyukov type, Fetyukov type thrives in Western society. He saw this first in the misdeeds of the Western media. Reporters mobbed him from the second he arrived at the Bavarian home of the German novelist Heinrich Boll, his first destination in exile. Aware of how vulnerable his friends and loved ones were back home, Solzhenitsyn declined all interviews, that is, except with one reporter who had assisted him greatly in Russia. This sent another journalist into such a fit of jealousy that he published a story claiming that the reporter who had been rewarded had brought Solzhenitsyn a secret letter from his wife. This was an outright falsehood. It could have endangered Solzhenitsyn's wife, who was then trying desperately to protect the author's hidden archives from the KGB in Moscow before escaping herself. And it jeopardized the ability of the honest reporter to work in the Soviet capital. Yet neither the envious reporter who had written the false story nor his outlet took any responsibility or showed any remorse. Solzhenitsyn recalled in his mem memoir, quote, every encounter I had with the media in my first days in the West filled me with bewilderment, end quote. Then there was the mean legalism that permeated the West's commercial practices and its social climate. Solzhenitsyn's books were global blockbusters, but he had written them with a moral and spiritual purpose, namely to awaken the world to the evils of the Soviet Union and to help liberate his compatriots. He had put together one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich and the Gulag Archipelago in the bricklaying spirit of his character Shukhov, an outpouring of solidarity, a writerly act of true freedom, order to what he ought to have done, given his talents. Yet in one country, bookshops refused to honor, honor his request to sell the archipelago at a lower markup than they would books of similar late so more people could read it. In another country, one publisher kept bringing out pirated, mangled, badly translated editions of his works. Why? to profit off his literary labor, the research and writing he had done in defiance of the KGB, often in secret under conditions of censorship and repression, no Western publisher or editor could begin to fathom. In America, one of the largest corporate publishers tried to nickel and dime him at every turn, drawing up staggeringly one-sided publishing contrasts in which every risk and even the smallest cost were laid at the author's shoulders. 
We honor your sacrifice, Mr. Solzhenitsyn, but as the contract signed on your behalf here says, the author must bear all incidental postal charges for mailing review copies and the, for, for the production of an index. Most of the sophisticated hucksters who took control of his book's foreign rights, including one especially predatory Wall Street figure, were quite, were, quote, quite indifferent to the literary and political aspects of the matter. All they cared about was that, quote, something of material value is lying untapped and that a hefty profit can be made from it. To assert his rights, he would have to go to court against publishers that treated his blood equity as a commodity and, quote, God, how I bulk at this with my entire soul. Western styles litigation, he concluded, was a profanation of the soul, an ulceration, as the world has entered a legal era, gradually replacing man's conscience with the law, the spiritual level of the world has sunk, end quote. The various publishers even went to war among themselves over his material, and when he tried to reconcile them, they would insist on fighting to the last in the courts. Quote, the Western court system is drowned in a litigious quagmire, choked by the letter of the law, the thread of its spirit lost, so often affording crooks and swindlers an advantage, end quote. In the West, the spirit of Fetyukov so often triumphed legally over the spirit of Shukov. Most shocking of all was how this obsessive profiteering motive even worked to the advantage of communist regimes. He saw this crisply soon after his arrival in the West, when a Swiss trading company dismissed one of its interpreters, we would say canceled today, over complaints from a Soviet client. The client had attacked Solzhenitsyn's writing and the interpreter had asked, but have you read Solzhenitsyn, which was enough to get her fired. And this in the oldest democracy in Europe, quote, free and independent. At one point, Solzhenitsyn was even taken advantage of by the contractors he hired to build his house in rural Vermont, Vermont where he had settled after leaving Europe. They dragged out the work, did a shoddy job in places and stung him with an unaccountably fat invoice. There is something bitterly humorous in this, the writer who had outsmarted the KGB on a thousand occasions, who had survived hard labor in the frigid cold, bested by the deviousness of the small town American contractor and quote, the ordeal of the Western financial system, end quote. Finally, there was the sheer disorder that sullied the West's moral and physical landscape. On a tour of Italy, Solzhenitsyn saw the country's monumental glories, quote, covered with graffiti, painted with hammers and sickles, slogans and threats, police are killers, death to fascist Christian Democrats. Columns that had survived barbarian invasions and Lord knows what else now blared, long live proletarian violence. The slogans must have especially irked a man who had tasted proletarian violence firsthand, but worse was the question these displays must have raised in the author's mind. Was this what he and his compatriots had fought for in defying communist repression? It was this simmering pot of emotions and observations that boiled over when Solzhenitsyn addressed the Harvard grads. In the gulag, he had surveyed the moral heights people could reach by doing what they ought to have done, despite the pressures exerted by a lawless prison state. In the West, meanwhile, he saw free men and women and society as a whole failing to make any distinction between freedom to do what ought to be done and the freedom to do what ought not. And here lay the philosophical heart of his critique of the West. As he put it at Harvard, quote, today's Western society has revealed an inequality between freedom for the good and freedom for evil deeds. The two, freedom for good and freedom for evil, aren't the same thing. Indeed, the latter doesn't even qualify as freedom since it breeds self-degradation. He saw this in concentrated form in the lives of prisoners like Fetyukov, but the idea stretches all the way back to the, to the, to the Bible with, a, with, with a, a, the Gospel of St. John, the idea that every man who commits sin is a slave to sin. And I will stop there. And, uh, and I think it's, it, that's enough to give a taste of the chapter without hogging up the whole time we have together. Um, what I would conclude with saying is that all the um, developments that still in nascent form or embryonic form Solzhenitsyn had diagnosed in 1978 um, have accelerated. Um, and the clearest example, which is not in the chapter because when I was writing it, this had not happened yet, is how that actually has affected journalism, the field that I work in. Um, as you remember in October, uh, New York, the New York Post, the newspaper that I worked with, uh, worked for, which is the oldest continuously published daily paper in the United uh, States, and it was founded by Alexander Hamilton, published a story about uh, uh, Hunter Biden and raising questions about graft involving him and his father, then the vice president of the United States, now the re leader of the free world. It's the, the most clear uh, calling and noblest calling of, of my profession 
it's to shed light on situations like that. And yet, as you'll remember, um, precisely as, as, as uh, Solzhenitsyn diagnosed in my bits about the press, um, the very corporate agendas and vast kind of agglomerations of corporate power managed to silence that story. We not only were, uh, had lost our Twitter account, but uh, it, Facebook reduced circulation on the story. And you couldn't even direct message it to your peers, not let alone publish the story on your public newsfeed. Um, so you, we see precisely how um, the bare legalism, the idea that all that matters is the fact that, for example, these are private entities doing this as opposed to public entities, has worked to the effect of, in terms of, uh, as a meaningful reality, rather than the legal or formal distinction, uh, the freedom of the press is completely jeopardized. It's become reduced to a kind of paper promise. So um, that's just one example, but um, I will stop there um, and just note with gratitude um, the prescience and the, the prophecy of this man, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Saurabh. Um, I'm there's so many interesting figures in the book, uh, but I'm glad you went with Solzhenitsyn for us tonight, uh, someone who's, who's very dear to me and from whom I've learned quite a bit. But before we turn to questions about Solzhenitsyn, and, and let me remind everyone watching that please send in your questions in the Q&A tab, uh, and those will come to me. Before we turn to questions on Solzhenitsyn though, can I go back to kind of the framing pattern of the book? So early in the book, right in the introduction, you're setting up imagined possible futures for, for your son, Max, who is what, probably three years old now? He's, he's turned four now. And you give a scenario of Max home from college, right? He's 21, 22. And then another scenario where Max is 47 years old, uh, which is the same age, I gather, that Maximilian Kolbe was when he died. Now, obviously, you're articulating scenarios that you find frightening, ones you hope will not occur. Um, you're, as I see it, you're sort of imagining a, a fearsome future for Max, which looks a lot like the deracinated alienation of, of elites, maybe those who don't have worry, a full tradition going for them. Now, parents awaken in the night all the time, worried about their children's future, of course. But there seems to me almost a kind of inevitability to your fears that you articulate, that it's it's not just an imagined scenario of, of which you're afraid, but that it seems likely or even very likely. Uh, you write, no amount of gratitude can allay the anxiety that grips me when I ask myself, what kind of a man will contemporary Western culture chisel out of my son? But all sorts of contemporary Americans live decent lives and have decent children. Uh, my work with college students gives me uh, hope because so many of them are just fundamentally decent people. Uh, I remember I used to read Peter Augustine Lawler and struggled. And eventually he convinced me that you could have a good life in contemporary America, even in the suburbs. Why is the anxiety so gripping or why does it have a sense of likelihood for you, Sora? Thank you. Thank you for, your, for that question. Um, it's a good one. I think that there are several scenarios that I ruled out that are much worse than the ones I paint. I should, I should kind of describe what I, what I paint so that um, viewers can know. The, the scenario that I describe is not that my son will be like an opioid addict. Um, I assume that he will likely inherit his parents' um, elite status, which <clears throat> as we know, the elites are very good at passing on um, that status. Um, and Rather, what I imagine is him coming home and, you know, he's gone to some elite college and he's now about to work at a publishing house or a hedge fund or whatever meritocratic colony you wish to imagine. And all he talks about is, is money. Um, he, you know, I might have a girlfriend, but he has no intention to marry her. Can't imagine marrying her because that would be an encumbrance to his um, true self, which seeks to be unencumbered across life's realms, not least not to be attached to anyone. And bottom line is that he, he, although he's in one sense successful and has gotten away in life, he doesn't bind himself irrevocably to any deeper thing than just getting ahead and partying around. Now, it's true that, you know, truth be told, that's a, that's a, a, a grimmer scenario that I, I, I 
will do my damnedest to make sure it doesn't become, become reality. But um, the reason I describe him that way is because I already see patterns like that among elites. Is it true that there are lots of um, young elites who, who, as you say, and I know them as well, who live absolutely purposeful lives of faith, family, dedication, or religious vocation, and so forth? Absolutely. But the general trend um, which you can look at, even statistically speaking, in terms of uh, family formation rates, um, uh, fertility rates, um, religious uh, affiliation, um, those all suggest that the scenario I draw for Max, unless uh, I have to struggle heroically, those are likely scenarios. Now, I will struggle heroically, but what I argue, and what I've argued outside this book as well, as, as you know, RJ, is that um, a, a, a well-ordered society shouldn't set up this kind of gauntlet for people to live virtuous, purposeful lives and so provide so many temptations and such, I guess, as I said, impoverished account of what it means to be really free and what it means to be happy that you have to, you have to fight off the pornographer who's likely to grab your kid before he turns, uh, before he hits puberty and, fi <laughs> and, and fight off the likelihood of hookup culture, fight off drugs, um, uh, fight off a, a, a corporate life that um, you know, demands enormous amount of time from, for, uh, um, for family so they don't get to spend time together and so on and so forth. Um, and then say, well, you succeeded, bravo. I, it should be easier to live lives of virtue and a, a good society should efficaciously do so. Sorry for a long answer. No, that's good. Um, my wife and I will sometimes remark that many of the old institutions that you think you can count on or should be able to count on to help you with your children, you don't necessarily feel like you can count on them or they're there to support you. And so you feel like you're doing something quasi heroic or alone just to get to, nor to decency and normalcy. Yeah, that's, thank you for that. Um, thinking of institutions, I was struck that so many figures in the book that you choose to, as your interlocutors, seem to be alienated from the, in, their own formative institutions. So Newman leaves Anglicanism, Jonas and Solzhenitsyn both have to struggle against different forms of despotism. Seneca gets exiled. Thurman has to deal with the legacy of slavery. Even Confucius, who I think of as, as kind of an institution builder, the way you frame or contextualize the story with him is a story of fratricide, right? Of a son killing a father and needing to deal with the chaos that emerges from that. Andrea Dworkin does not seem to me to be someone at home in the institutions, many of the institutions of the West. Even the others who don't seem to be alienated from institutions, like somebody like C.S. Lewis happily at home in, in Oxford or Cambridge, or Aquinas happily ensconced in the Dominicans, I don't think of them as being institutional builders. They're kind of at home in an institution. In a, in a book on tradition, why is one of the basic questions of your 12 not where do you belong or where is your place or where are you from? And why are the figures that you point to not sort of famous for belonging? You know, it seems to me that at least one aspect of tradition is participation, belonging, being at home in a place. I think of someone like Roger Scruton that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of indebted to, who makes institutional participation kind of a major theme of tradition. Why is there so little place and uh, being at home in the figures of tradition, Saurabh? Well, I, I, have to, I have to dispute that characterization. So, you know, sure. I, I, Aquinas, certainly the way I describe him is that he's plugged into this cosmopolitan um, world of scholarship and uh, world of the church in which, um, in which the fact that there's, you know, the kind of a, a unity of faith and unity of mission uh, and a unity of language um, uh, leaves him very comfortable. You know, he's going from Paris to Cologne to Munich, da, 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 and, uh, you know, to Italy. Um, and um, he's, he's at home across Christendom, as it were. Um, so I don't think that's quite true of him. C.S. Lewis, again, is another one who is, as you said, I mean, he's, um, he, he's a son of, a son of, uh, of Ireland. And I, and I insist that although he's a son of Northern Ireland, who then adopted the Republic of Letters as his true home and became such an Oxford man, if you pay attention, and as I'm sure you have, RJ, and you know him well, if you pay attention, especially to his fictions, um, he is 
deeply, deeply still Irish. He's a he's a son of Ireland, and and the the Irish people's love of language, love of story, permeates his work. So I'm not sure that's true. That said, um, of others of the of the other, I was I would say Confucius. I would put in the same category. Just sure. utterly comfortable in, in in and an institution builder. Seneca totally comfortable in in the Roman world and a wheeler and dealer. And his his death even is part of that because that that was that was pagan uh, Rome. Um, but others, you're right. I mean, um, uh, Andrew Dorgan is a deeply, deeply alienated figure. Um, uh, Newman is at odds with with uh, the Anglican uh, currents of his era, and with with uh, liberalism of various sorts as as they express themselves in 19th century Britain. And yeah, I don't I don't have a particular explanation for that, other than to say that. Um, uh, perhaps in a book in which uh, the aim is to critique contemporary cultural, political, and, and economic arrangements and to use um, these figures to cast doubt on some of our own certainties, it would make sense for some of the figures, even in their own setting, to be confrontational, to be alienated. Um, because then you see that um, people who more emblematically represent the different traditions represented in the book also in some ways found themselves as a as we would in relation to our own time. Um, and so that's a kind of uh, you have a kind of hope for what we can achieve if if we're willing to be discomfited by what we found or find around us. And I don't think that's at odds with a traditional impulse. But that said, again, I do think that there are lots of figures in the book that do belong in their world, and um, therefore the belonging is reflected in their in the dramas of their lives. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Sora. Yeah. It's uh, for someone like myself who who thinks of localism as part of tradition, or at least a live option to consider in tradition. Uh, the question of where are you from would be one I would love to see you write about and think about. That's, that's, that's a fair point. I would also warn though that it's an, I think it's a mistake to equate traditionalism necessarily with localism. Yep, no, I'm with you. Tradition can also be cosmopolitan. Um, for I mean, obviously anything can be cosmopolitan, as cosmopolitan as the natural law. Very good, very nice. Um, I'm gonna ask Abigail Anthony to join us. Uh, Abigail is a student at Princeton. She's a student journalist. Uh, she's had essays appear in the Princeton Tory and recently in the National Review. And uh, she has a question or two for you, Sora. Thank you, Mr. Amari, for uh, such an informative and eloquent presentation. Um, you explored freedom of the press and journalism, but I was wondering if you could comment on how language itself contributes to our cultural construction of what is morally and socially acceptable. Um, for example, I had never heard the term anti-racism prior to 2020, but now I think I hear it every day. Um, and I think a lot of liberals would use the term anti-racism or anti-racist without hesitation. Meanwhile, conservatives disdain the terms. Um, do you think that these terms emerged naturally in society without any journalistic force, or do you think they're a product of the media? That's a very good question. Um, and congratulations on your recent publications and, and look forward to if, if you'd like to write for a feisty tabloid uh, from time to time and not just these uh, these elevated places, you know, let me know. Um, no, to answer your question, I think I think constructs like anti-racism are 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 products of of an elite of an elite uh, journalistic elite and a kind of nexus of journalistic and academic elites who um, really have a vision and, and it's, it's one that I find alarming and sinister, but they do have a vision and they seek to transform it. And they know how the use of language, uh, as, you, as you rightly point out, by reframing things linguistically um, so that you're like, I'm not, a, I'm not a racist, but that's not enough. That itself is under the new kind of dispensation is, is itself a sign of racism. Um, and, um, you know, they're very clever about it. And, and, um, and so we should be courageous in, in not succumbing to the terminology of absolutely opposing racism in all, all its forms, as I do, um, and nevertheless not adopting a terminology that suggests that um, people by dint of their sin color kind of carry forever an, an unwashable stain of racial sin, um, or certainly in issues of gender and gender ideology, 
that's where language very much comes in. And we'll all have to show a lot more courage in the coming years to use language um, as St. Thomas teaches, you know, use, use language as the common people use them because um, uh, uh, among other things that, that um, ordinary language can be closer to reality than kind of concocted terms um, like whatever zir, zir, and, and the kind of whatever pronouns that they've created. So very good question, but I, I, I see design more than organic development. Following up on that, there's a question that came in through the Q&A tab. And if you, if you have questions, please use that tab. But one of the questions that the audience sends us, Saurabh, is what solutions do you or Solzhenitsyn identify to help the culture of the West get out of the problem of censorship? And if I can tack on my own question to that, what would be the proper ro role or place of procedural liberalism in doing so, if any? Sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute. Um, let me answer the first question uh, in, a, in a concrete way first, in a concrete way first. Um, I do think we need to reform uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So this is completely out of the sphere of, uh, of, of, uh, of the book and just a kind of uh, policy discussion. Um, it's, frank, it's, it's just downright unfair that, you know, we at the New York Post, if we publish libelous material, we would be held uh, liable in court, civilly liable. But if if a Twitter user pub, you know libels you, you can sue the Twitter user. But because of the Communications Decency Act, Section two hundred and thirty, you cannot sue Twitter. As you know, the law was enacted in the nineteen nineties um, at a time when neither Twitter nor Facebook existed. But the idea was that to allow these bulletin board type platforms to, as good Samaritans regulate prurient material, child pornography, violent threats, and so forth, and therefore that they should be allowed somewhat to act like publishers, yet be immune from a traditional publisher's liability. Um, but as we now know, Twitter and Facebook and the other platforms are acting like publishers with a kind of clear editorial voice and stories that they won't allow to be published and, and those that they, they, they will publish. And so, um, uh, I would argue that that's we, we need to we need to change that. Um, there are many different solutions. One is to scrap it and just let them let them be subject to, to uh, normal publisher liabilities and see if that means they won't censor as much anymore. Uh, or uh, you know, giving you a private right of action if you're unfairly censored, so on and so forth. Um, I, I would do that. And the other thing I would say is, look, is is this procedural liberalism have a have a role in this. I would argue that a certain kind of doctrinaire dogmatic liberalism um, is blocking the passage to change because it says that, well, these are private actors um, and not public actors, and therefore they should be able to do whatever they want. The problem with that is that the public-private distinction is just, it, it's the kind of legalism that I think Solzhenitsyn would have raised his eyebrow at because, um, you know, I can I, I, look. I live in Manhattan. I can go out into the street and say, "Hunter Biden is corrupt." Bang, 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 bang my drum, and but people would think I'm a nutter and ignore me. If freedom of the press, in its true sense, in, in the sense that the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, "Why, why uh, the press has a responsibility in society, modern society," if it means anything, if it lives or dies, it lives or dies on these platforms. So, in so far as a certain kind of liberal proceduralism would end the inquiry at whether or not the actor doing this kind of behavior is public or private, it stands in the way of the kinds of reforms that I think we need. Yeah, Solzhenitsyn on legalism, when he talks about freedom of the academy, for instance, all, your, all of your professors are free and they all say the same thing and, and they have, in his view, not the courage to actually to speak. They have the procedures and, and not the substance. Yeah. I have several questions on a similar theme, um, which go like this. Do you think that conservatives do harm to their children by trying to develop them into elites? Would children be happier living a different way of life? Should we try to stay out of large institutions and elite institutions? I think we, conservatives, but also ordinary ambient liberal liberalism, liberals where I live I'm, I'm in, the, in, in Manhattan, Midtown East, Upper East Side, they, I think we do need more courage, bottom line is what I'm saying, is that they, because at the end of the day, they wanna make sure their children attend institutions like Princeton or, or whatever, they're willing to 
tolerate. So I, I wrote an op-ed based on the book, but it's material not from the book where I uh, pointed out how a lot of parents in New York com come and complain to me because I'm the only conservative they know. And so they'll go and say, you know, oh man, the, the, uh, the woke stuff that they're stuffing down my children's throats at school is awful. But there's a reason why they just come to me and they do it in hushed tones. Mm -hmm but they will continue to shell out fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year for, for tuition at Beerley or Dalton. And bottom line, they're willing to put up with woke rule if it means their own kids get to inherit their elite status. And that, uh, I'm even sometimes guilty of that bottom line is that you, you, you deal with institutions and you want your kid to succeed in a material way and get ahead. And I think that's, that is a, a lack of courage, as, again, as Solzhenitsyn would point out. And it doesn't have to be that way for all these people because they do have the means and, and if enough of us speak up, we can do something. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, would I say that then we should try to avoid the command, commanding heights? Absolutely not. I think one of the key ways we have to change things is by taking the commanding heights and reordering um, the whole game, rejiggering the whole game so that it's more supportive of the, end, the you know conservative uh, ends. Um, so those two seem to be in tension with each other um, but ne they needn't be. In other words, you can speak up in your institutions and take some risks in that way, but also work to train a generation of elites, maybe through other institutions like uh, classical Christian academies that can still pull, you know, as they, as they grow and become important. Uh, places like Thomas Aquinas College, Witherspoon Institute, where it's a sort of alternative formation for elites. Um, you still have the kind of elite benefits but you're also able to enter mainstream institution and um, change them to, with conservative ends in mind. We have to have presence. We have to be there in some ways. Yeah. Uh, I'll introduce you to Dr. Marcus Gibson, who has a question. Um, Get, Marcus is the John and Daria Berry Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Princeton University. He's also the Executive Director of the Princeton Initiative of Catholic Thought, which is a, a new initiative that's been launched uh, here in town recently. So uh, Marcus, please. First, thank you for your presentation tonight and thank you for writing this much needed book. Uh, this question is prompted by your chapter on John Henry Newman and the relationship between authority and conscience. Uh, it's a chapter that witnesses powerfully to the idea that trust and authority rightly understood play indispensable roles in the mission we have to seek and hand on wisdom. I take it that fostering a genuine spirit of inquiry also has its part to play in that mission, working in the context of trust and authority. And something that your book and Aquinas' Summa Theologia have in common is that they're both structured by questions, and these questions draw us into conversation with these great authoritative voices of the past. So my question is, we have this mission to recover and build on the wisdom of the past, in light of that mission here and now, uh, how do we foster a genuine spirit of inquiry that on the one hand avoids a mere repetition of past insights, but on the other hand, avoids the latitudinarianism that Newman opposed all his life? Well, this, this, these are deep and good questions. Thank you, Marcus, and congratulations on the launch of, of the center. I'm so pleased that that's housed within the university. Um, so. Uh, Wonderful. Um, I, I'm going to give a, a Catholic answer to that, um, a Catholic specific answer to that, um, and um, see if it satisfies. And we can then ponder whether there are analogs in other non Catholic settings. But this idea of, uh, of thinking with the church to me seems like a good mission for the kind of well, first of all, the work that you want to do at the, at, the, at, the, at the new institute, but also the question that you ask. That is that um, I, you know, I don't set out from the outset to oppose authority, to oppose dogma, to oppose the magisterium, um, but rather uh, I situate myself in a, in a spirit of sympathetic, docile inquiry. But notice that sympathetic and docile added to inquiry, meaning you're not, uh, you, you are capable of using natural reason and applying it to new settings, which uh, 
settings and circumstances which uh, uh, modern moral dilemmas present, which may not have been fully developed in, in doctrine, but your, your attitude, there is a component of docility to authority in your attitude that I think um, actually makes you a stronger inquirer as a thinker. Joseph Pieper says of Thomas Aquinas that <clears throat> the reason um, he could deal with Aristotle in a, in a reverential way and in a, in a, obviously make great use of him, but not become an Aristotle worshiper like let's say some of the sort of Arab Aristotelians like Averroes is because uh, you know he had this relation to the to the church um, and, and 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 God is there as this absolute as you know the ultimate cause da 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 and so he can um, he can then do, deal with whoever might come around whether it's Aristotle or Heidegger today or or Marx and not kind of be worshipful of, of any of them but I think that again it's that attitude of uh, precisely to be bound to one authority and to be docile with respect to it frees you to be critical everywhere else in a, in a I think, in a, in a liberating way. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So can I follow up on that? So to be bound to one authority, to think along with the church, and yet the book doesn't draw upon just one tradition. It, it draws upon a variety of traditions. You, you acknowledge this at the beginning of the book. You say, look, some skeptics might think that maybe I'm um, betraying my, the, my Catholicism by drawing upon other, other sources. Others might think I'm smuggling in Catholicism by drawing on other sources. Um, there's tradition, there's traditions, and then there's sort of capital T tradition, but I don't know what that is. If we take somebody like McIntyre seriously, McIntyre acknowledges that there's a variety of traditions. They may have similar questions, but the language and meaning is not necessarily the same. Um, is your own tradition here overly cosmopolitan? Uh, that's a very good question that every intelligent reader of the book poses, and I'm sort of surprised it took till 750 for it to <laughs> for it to come up. So I, I, I'm grateful for your for your asking it. Um, it's absolutely true that um, the book spans not only my own tradition, which I do put a capital T next to Catholic tradition as this uh, tradition with a capital T uh, 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 as this un special source of authority in, in our faith. Um, and then these other traditions, Abraham Joshua Heschel is a, is a Hasidic rabbi. Um, uh, Howard Thurman is a, is a kind of a, a, a Baptist. Confucius is completely outside these kind of Judeo-Christian uh, matrices. Um, so uh, the answer to that is that every reader of the book will notice that although these traditions are quite disparate and diverse, every chapter involves the working out of a strange paradox. And so that tells me something about these traditions that, um, uh, and that paradox is this. It, it, it'll sound familiar to readers of my friend Patrick Deneen's book, Why Liberalism Failed as well, which is that something that appears as a limit um, turns out to be a source of liberation. That is some, some restriction on our, our freedom of will or freedom of, of thought or freedom to self-define, uh, when we demolish it paradoxically, we end up less free, less than fully, less than fully human um, and less happy. So there's a kind of unity in that. So uh, Rabbi Heschel stands for the idea of, of the concept of the institution of the Sabbath as a source of liberation. Again, it looks like restriction. You're not you like to use your time however much, however you like to shop, to play, to work out, to, but instead you're called to not do something and, and to not seek the goods that you normally seek the other six days of the week. And yet the loss of the Sabbath has actually made our lives harried and miserable. Seneca, the idea of natural death as a, as a although as a Christian, you might look at it as obviously a, something inscribed in our destiny by sin. Nevertheless, it's a reality and the effort to overcome it biotechnologically or what have you is actually make your daily life miserable. And so Seneca says, just live life as it could be your last day and that liberates you. 
um, Hans Jonas with the body. The limit of the body is, is it, to, to see your body as a, uh, as a part of an orderly whole is to see your body as governed by certain norms. And there's a relationship between part and whole that makes you um, uh, 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 responsible for your body and not seek to disdain um, who you are in, as, as, an, as a dynamic fusion of soul and, and, and body. So th there is that thread that ties all of the traditions cited into the book uh, together. And again, hence the title. Um, but uh, as, as a Catholic, I guess the way the, the, to, to, to reconcile what seems like the kind of cosmopolitanism is um, the fact that uh, insofar as these traditions reflect wisdom and insofar as God is a reasonable God who's left his imprint on, on all human beings across cultures, times, and civilizations, um, they can cohere um, with, with the capital T tradition as well. In some places they don't. Seneca was like way too comfortable with set for with suicide, and obviously Saint Augustine, who's in the book, begins the city of God with a with a moral case against suicide. And I I, I leave those tensions open, um, but uh, insofar as they cohere is where I cohere together. Whereas is what I emphasize. You you talk about paradoxes here uh, that are so, in some ways held in common because they all in the various chapters and various traditions are pushing back or questioning, challenging, what for many of us is just a prima facie assumption, which is freedom is the absent of constraint, a kind of unfettered freedom. That sounds like in some ways you're, would it be fair to say you're using tradition to liberate us from liberation? <laughs> liberate us from, from non-restraint? Yeah, or, or, or the view that um, uh, freedom as the mere choice between um, different contraries um, is the highest good of human life. Um, in some situations, yeah, I, I want to be able to pick dinner. I don't want to eat the same dinner every night if I can avoid it. So sometimes I want to eat fish and sometimes I want to eat burger. But um, um, but to make that as the sort of ultimate principle of, of life is, is impoverishes us and it, it, it uh, harms other, uh, it, it um, harms our ability to access other goods that are that are also important. The, the book is not a Jeremiah, but it is a critique in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's moderate in tone, it's friendly, it's inviting, but it's still a critique of unfettered freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering though, if in the book you answer your own question from chapter nine, I'm, I'm asking, do you? Uh, chapter nine, the Souls and Eats in chapter is entitled, What is Freedom For? Mm -hmm. Do you answer that? Yeah, it's freedom for the good. Freedom to do what you ought to do. Um, I think I answer, I don't know if I, um, to, to be honest, the, the uh, original title of the chapter was, um, Are You Too Free? And my editor uh, insisted that it should be, What is Freedom For? Um, and, um, but nevertheless, I mean, I think the, the, I answer in the book that insofar as our account of freedom reduces it, it reduces it as the mere just uh, choice, regardless of whether it's choice between good or evil, um, then we aren't uh, free enough. And um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I do conclude the chapter by suggesting that freedom is found in a life of limits accepted, in a life of humane responsibilities and commitments, and a life in which you're able to commit to things irrevocably. If you always keep your options open, you don't actually exercise your freedom. Your, your freedom stays in a sort of state, state of, uh, uh, it, it's near potentiality, but as you never actually actualize it because you've kept your quote unquote options open. It's one of my least favorite phrases in the English language. Um, and, uh, and that's, I think that the, the ultimate a a end of our contemporary impoverished account of freedom is that precisely because we don't, we don't accept tradition as this kind of sense of ordered continuity where I know what lies behind me. I know that there are uh, paths that are, my ancestors have taken. There's wisdom that I can accept so I can leap confidently into the future. A lot of us don't do that these days and we kind of keep our options open and it in practice means we just sort of float to, through life. I think there's a lot there. Uh, I wish we had more time, but we have just a few minutes left. So I want to, I want to get to something from Dan's review from today, if you don't yeah. mind. Yeah. So Dan Mahoney, who's a very fine scholar, knows Souls and Eatson very well. If you, if you don't know Dan's work, 
Um, you know, this is one of Dan's edited volume, The Souls and Eats and Reader, and, and everyone should get a hold of it. Dan suggests that you might have missed one aspect of Souls and Eatson's famous 78 Harvard address. And here's how Dan puts it. I'm quoting Dan from, from the review. Mm. Amari misses Souls and, Eatons, Souls and Eatson's final call for us to, quote, move up from modernity by finding true balance in the human soul in the human world. Still quoting, we must resist not only the claim that man is the highest thing in the universe, but also the tyranny of the spiritual, which tends to forget the centrality of human freedom to life well lived. In the address, particularly in the final chapters, this is me now, not Dan, Solzhenitsyn concludes, or I'm asking how you, how you make sense of the text here. Mm -hmm. Solzhenitsyn doesn't seem to conclude with a call for tradition. Mm -hmm. He talks about the climbing to the next anthropological stage. Sounds like Tehar de Chardin almost. Mm -hmm. He uses phrases like upward, a spiritual blaze, a rise to a new height of vision, a new level of life. What's Solzhenitsyn talking about in those final sections? And is he correct? And is he pointing to something beyond tradition, a, a new tradition? That, that is the kind of bit of a, of a, of a Russian mystic type where um, I, I, I don't think that those, and the reason I don't highlight them is because I don't think they, that the, the, the speech loses its inner, inner integrity when it, when it reaches this kind of mystical um, stage. But insofar as to attempt to suggest that Solzhenitsyn had in mind an inner integrity, what I th take for that is what I just said, which is that um, if you if you are bounded to true authorities, if you uh, respect the wisdom of the past, then you can move forward in modernity. And you don't you don't in fact you don't have to be a traditionalist, which is a term that I'm always suspicious of. A traditionalist suggests that tradition is something that is itself provisional, weakened, and therefore a traditionalist has to come around and um, give it an ideological ism to make it uh, alive in modernity. But if you have this other account of tradition as, as, as uh, this kind of perennial wisdom, um, I think you're able to move forward in, up from modernity. I mean, I think that's a good phrase for it. Um, but uh, yeah, there is a Deschardin aspect to the end of the speech, you're right. Yeah, I'd love to hear, uh, I'd love to have Dan Mahoney and you talk that one out because I think Dan thinks that that final aspect of the speech is part of the inner logic of the text. So that, that would be interesting to see. And if, if Dan listening, I, I hope to see an essay from at public discourse from you soon about that. So Rob, congratulations on the book uh, and all the great reviews that are coming out about it. Uh, I, I'm assuming it's a project uh, that's near and dear to you, not only because of the, the question of tradition, but because of course you're in the end, you're writing a letter to your son with, a, of, with advice and, uh, and obvious parental care. Uh, I hope he reads it soon and you know, real, real and hearty congratulations to you and thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. If you don't subscribe to the public discourse, uh, you should, I hope you do. You'll see the link in order to buy copies of Sorab's book if you like. Uh, and all of you have my thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, and Sorab, thanks so much again and, and best wishes for the rest of the, the book tour. Thank you and thank you also for the review. I really appreciate it. Good, thanks everybody. Cheers, bye.